Let's get into the Word. So we are in our series called uh, Your Word in My Heart. And our title for this series comes from Psalm 119, in which David talks about how precious God's Word, His commandments, and His statutes, and His precepts are. It's the longest psalm at 176 verses. So it's kind of a big deal that David is making about God's Word. He takes 176 verses to just elaborate on how good and amazing and awesome God's Word is. And so in this series, we want to look at the value and necessity of God's Word. We want to look at this, right, our Bible, and why it is so crucial to our lives as followers of Christ, what God has to say about His Word, and ultimately why we should hide or treasure it in our hearts, as David says in Psalm 119. Meaning that we should know God's word in such a way that it is at the core of who we are. That it guides us, teaches us, protects us, encourages us, rebukes us, and so much more. As followers of Christ, we can't ignore the Bible. We can't settle for someone else knowing all of it, and we just get to cruise through life. We need to and are admonished to over and over again to hide his word in our hearts, to know it, treasure it, memorize it, and meditate on it, carefully observe it, live by it, and be obedient to it. Hence the series named Your Word in My Heart. Our series began with looking at God's encouragement to Joshua after Moses had just died. God told Joshua to carefully observe his word and to meditate day and night on it, not letting it depart from his mouth. And in doing so, Joshua did not have to be afraid because by observing and meditating on his word day and night, he would remember God's faithfulness and his promises. And then we looked at Psalm 1, and the call to not walk with the wicked, but to delight in God's word and once again meditate on it day and night. Because you will be fruitful and glorifying to God. You'll live this righteous life and not be following in the ways of the wicked. And last week we looked at James 1 and the admonishment from James to not merely just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. God's word is not solely for listening to and studying. It is to be acted upon. It is to directly influence every aspect of our lives. For if we are hearers only we deceive ourselves. We completely miss the point of all this. It's like looking in a mirror and forgetting what we look like the next second. In all these, we have the common theme of God's word being essential, being a necessity to any who, find, who identify themselves as one of God's people, to anyone who has faith in him. Because there is something vital to knowing God's word, to having it hidden in our hearts, as Psalm 119 says. And as we'll see today, there is a reason why we treasure and so highly value his word. It's because it originates from him. There's a reason why we refer, why we refer to the Bible as God's word, or the word of God. It's because God is the source of all of the words in here. And I'll explain what I mean by that this morning and and why it's so important to us because ultimately without it, if we don't treasure his word and have his word in our heart, we're completely missing something crucial to our faith. As Paul will make clear, we're incomplete, we're lacking, we're unequipped. So in our passage for today in 2 Timothy, we'll see how having God's word in our heart can equip and make us ready for this life of faith. So in this letter, Paul is writing to Timothy. Surprise, surprise, right? Second Timothy. And this isn't just a random letter to a random guy that Paul knows. In both of his letters to Timothy, Paul refers to him as his son in the faith. Paul has played a crucial role in Timothy's life. Paul has discipled him. He's served alongside him, raising Timothy into the leader he now is. This is Paul's son in the faith. And as Paul is nearing the end of his life 
He wants to encourage and instruct Timothy to be faithful to Christ and what he has been called to. So in chapter 3, Paul begins by telling Timothy that hard times are ahead because they live in a world of sinful people that isn't getting better anytime soon. Timothy had seen Paul live out his faith and knows that persecution and suffering are coming, that evil people are getting worse. And so as we get to the passage we're looking at this morning, Paul's challenge to Timothy is to not be unequipped for what's to come, but to be a continual learner, to be submissive to God's word, and be ready and prepared for everything. So let's pray, and we'll read our passage for this morning and see how God's word calls us to be complete and equipped for every good work. Father, we, we love you and we thank you that we can know you, that you have revealed yourself through your word and through your son. God, you're so powerful and mighty and holy and perfect. And with that, you're merciful and compassionate, gracious and slow to anger and rich in faithful love. Father, as we look at your word this morning, I pray that we can be learning more about you, that we can be learning about ourselves in relation to you, and just how we can best live our life of faith following you. I pray that we come this morning with humble hearts, seeking to know you and the love that you have for us. I pray you can be molding us, transforming us into the people you desire us to be. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, declaring your praises to a world still lost in darkness. As we look at your word this morning, I pray you just be guiding us and teaching us what you desire. Pray in your name. Amen. Okay, so let's read 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting at verse 14. Paul says, But as for you, talking to Timothy, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed. You know those who taught you, and you know that from infancy you have known the sacred scriptures, which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Paul begins in verse 14 by specifically focusing on Timothy. He says, but as for you, because in verse 13 he had just been speaking about this, these evil people um, and they have no faith in God and they're continually being deceived. And so Paul speaks to Timothy in his past faithfulness and how he ought to continue in it. Paul is contrasting the way Timothy has lived up to this point in life with the evil people and imposters, the ones, as Paul says in verse 4, are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. These people will continue to deceive and be deceived as the times will get harder and harder. But Paul encourages Timothy to keep on doing what he has been doing to continue in what he has learned and firmly believed, what he has hidden or treasured in his heart, right? So that he may be complete and equipped for whatever comes his way. What was Paul urging Timothy to continue in that was so beneficial? Two things. The example of those who taught him and knowing the sacred scriptures. This leads us to our first point for today. Be a continual learner. Be a continual learner. In verses 14 and 15, Paul writes, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed. You know those who taught you, and you know that from infancy you have known the sacred scriptures, which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Be a continual learner. The Christian life is not just some single high point in our life where we put our faith in Christ and then we're just coasting until we die. That's not the Christian life. It's not just what you were taught when you were a kid in Sunday school or new in the faith. 
and now that you're older, you don't need to learn any of that anymore. No, we are called to grow in our knowledge and love of God until we die. Because guess what? I know you don't have it all figured out, and I definitely don't have it all figured out. None of us are living a holy and perfect and blameless life with a perfect knowledge of God and are glorifying him in all we say and do. If Paul is telling Timothy, his son in the faith, who had been raised by faithful and godly people and has known the scripture since his infancy, if he's telling Timothy to continue in what he has learned and believed, I think all of us can humbly admit we are without excuse for our need to be continual learners. As those who have faith in Christ, we ought to be learners of Christ for all of our lives. But there is always something for us to learn or grow in. And Paul echoes this idea in his prayers that he writes in his letters to the different churches. Because this isn't something just for Timothy, because he's like a, a super Christian, or he's incredibly gifted, or he's some amazing leader. It's because it's what Paul desires for every believer. I want you to turn to these passages with me and see Paul's words to the believers at these different churches. First is the book of Ephesians. Go back just a few books. Ephesians chapter 1. It's right after Galatians. Ephesians 1, starting at verse 17. These are all prayers that Paul has written to these churches. And so in his letter to the Ephesians, he addresses it to the faithful saints in Christ Jesus at Ephesus. It's not just the super holy people at Ephesus, it's to every believer at Ephesus. And he writes, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, would give you, everyone, the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what is the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the mighty working of his strength. Paul wants these believers to know and be enlightened to the amazing things that God has for us and who God is. In the same book, in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 uh, through 19, second part of verse 17, he says, I pray that you, once again, everyone, I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width, height and depth of God's love, and to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with with all the fullness of God. Paul wants this church to grasp at the surpassing knowledge of God's love. I don't think we're ever going to fully grasp it because it goes beyond our comprehension. So we're going to be learning about it for the rest of our lives. Now go to the book of Philippians, right after the book of Ephesians. Philippians chapter 1, starting at verse 9. Paul says, and I pray this, and once again, this is written to the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, every believer at Philippi, and I pray this, that your love will keep on growing in knowledge and every kind of discernment, so that you may approve the things that are superior and may be pure and blameless in the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Once again, growing in knowledge, growing in understanding God's love. And then in Colossians chapter 1, starting at verse 9. Colossians is right after Philippians. Colossians 1, verse 9. Paul writes this to the saints in Christ at Colossae, who are faithful brothers and sisters. This is to everyone, every believer. He says, for this reason also, since the day we heard this, we haven't stopped praying for you. We are asking that you may be filled with the wisdom of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, 
so that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. Paul writes some pretty profound and amazing prayers, and this is just for everyone. It's not just for Timothy. This is for every believer. Paul cares about every believer and wants every believer to know these things. Paul's desires that for all the groups of believers that he's ministering to, to continue to learn and grow in the love and knowledge of God. And he desires the same thing for Timothy too. And what we see in the life of Timothy is that he had people teaching him these things from an early age. He had good examples to follow. This is the first part of what Paul encourages Timothy to remember and reflect in reflect on and continue in. Paul says, you know those who taught you. And we know from the beginning of Paul's letter this, that this was Timothy's grandma and Timothy's mom. Timothy was the man he was because he had a mom and a grandma that loved the Lord and wanted Timothy to know all about him. They were role models of faith for him, his mom and his grandma. Just listen to what Paul says in the beginning of this letter. He's talking to Timothy, and he says, I recall your sincere faith that first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and now I am convinced is in you also. And just a side note real quick for parents and grandparents. Your role in the spiritual life of your child or grandchild is no joke. One of the greatest impacts you can make for the glory of God is teaching your children and grandchildren who God is and how to faithfully follow him. It's not the job of a Sunday school teacher or a youth leader to handle this on behalf of Christian parents. You don't just come and drop them off and they get their spiritual teaching. It lies on the shoulders of faithful parents and grandparents to raise their children up in the knowledge and love of God. And it's not to say that it's just biological parents and grandparents. I mean, we look at the t impact that Paul has had on the life of Timothy too. We all as the church are called to help raise up those younger than us, and especially those who have the honor and responsibility as moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas. And look at the impact it had on Timothy. Paul testifies that he sees the faith of Timothy's grandma and mom through him. And Paul tells Timothy to continue in the way, an example they set for him, the way that they lived out their faith. And the way that Lois and Eunice lived out their faith was all rooted in the sacred scriptures they had been teaching Timothy from infancy. The true source of what Paul wants Timothy to continue in is learning from these sacred scriptures of who God is and the salvation it points to through faith in Christ. What Paul is saying here is that it's not the scriptures or the knowledge of scriptures that save us, but the wisdom found in the scriptures point us to the Savior, Jesus Christ. A passage that makes the role of scripture very clear is during one of Jesus' encounters with the Jews in John's gospel. Turn to John chapter 5 with me. Now, I'll start at verse 17 and then skip around a little bit. But John chapter 5, verse 17. So in John 5, Jesus upset the Jews, surprise, surprise, for healing a man on the Sabbath. How dare he? How dare he heal a man on the Sabbath? But this upset the Jews because he did work on the Sabbath, right? So Jesus says in John 5, verse 17, My father is still working, and I am working also. And this infuriates the Jews. And in verse 18, it says, This is why the Jews began trying all the more to kill him. They wanted to kill Jesus. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal to God. 
So Jesus begins to prove to them why he can say what he says, the, the authority that he has. And a little later on, Jesus says that John the Baptist had testified concerning who Jesus was. But he has an even greater testimony than that. So in verses 35 through 37, skipping down a bit, Jesus is speaking and says, John was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a little while in his light. But I have a greater testimony than John's because of the works that the Father has given me to accomplish. These very works I am doing testify about me that the Father has sent me. The Father who sent me has himself testified about me. You have not heard his voice at any time, and you haven't seen his form. Jesus is talking to these Jews that are really upset with him, right? And right in verse 38 is when it gets real interesting and really convicting for the Jews that Jesus is addressing. He says in verse 38, You don't have his word residing in you because you don't believe the one he sent. You pour over the scriptures because you think you have eternal life in them, and yet they testify about me. But you are not willing to come to me so that you may have life. First off, Jesus drops the bomb on these people who've read and studied the Old Testament all their lives and says, you don't actually have God's word residing in you. And Jesus knows this, and he can say this because they don't believe in him. If you've been reading God's word for all your life and you completely miss Jesus as the Savior for humanity that atones for your sin and reconciles you back to God, then you obviously don't have his word residing in you. Your studying over the scriptures was pointless. God's word is not the source or means of our salvation. It's a huge arrow always pointing to Jesus. And for the Jews, they completely missed it. They wanted to kill Jesus. This, the Bible, all of this in here is meant to point us to Jesus. Old Testament and New Testament alike point us to Jesus as our only hope for salvation. And this is how Paul words it to Timothy. The wisdom of Scripture reveals the gospel. It's through Scripture that we see God is holy, just, and perfect. It's through Scripture that we see our sinfulness and our need for a Savior. It's through Scripture that we see that God is our righteous judge who hates sin. It's through Scripture that we see that our works or our good deeds will never suffice to pay the debt and cover the filth of our sin. It's through Scripture that we see that God is merciful and compassionate, slow to anger, and rich in his faithful, hessed love. It's through Scripture that we see God became man to die on our behalf and atone for our sins. And it's through Scripture that we see Jesus rose to new life, conquering sin and death, and allowing us to rise to new life with him for eternity. Owning a Bible, memorizing the Bible, studying the Bible does not save you. It all serves to point us to Jesus and his gospel, the salvation found in Jesus alone. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. So this is what Timothy is to continue in, all that he has been raised in since infancy, both in example of faith and in wisdom from the scriptures. Which begs the question for us, are we continual learners? Or are we just coasting through this life? Paul's desire for Timothy and all the believers in the church was that they grow in love and knowledge of God. So how are you living that out? How are you being discipled and raised up in the faith? Our church, we have Bible studies in small groups, like I announced during announcements, right? Uh, going on throughout the week, each week. This would be my number one recommendation for you to continue to grow in love and knowledge of God. To do so consistently with other believers. Being in God's word together doing life together, holding one another accountable, praying together, and so on. There will be much fruit if you commit to a group. And I pray that you do.
And if you're interested in that, come talk to me after service. I would love to give you more info on our small groups and Bible studies we have going on. So the first thing is be a continual learner. And our second point ties right into this. Point number two, be submissive to the word. Be submissive to the word. Going back to 2 Timothy, in chapter 3, verse 16, Paul writes, All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness. Here's the reason why Paul says sacred scriptures in verse 15. It is all inspired by God. The first part of verse 16 literally says, all scripture is breathed out by God. These words are from the breath of God. He is the source of all that is written down. And Paul drops this sentence in without any transition or conjunction or preposition. He, he goes from verse 15 saying, And you know that from infancy you have known the sacred scriptures, which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness. Paul wants this to stand out because he has something very important to say. We had just cleared up that it is not God's word that saves us, but that doesn't take away from its value. Paul teaches there is immense value in the word of God because it originates from God himself. But then the question may be bouncing around in your head is, well, how is God the source of it if sinful and fallible people wrote it? Great question. Fortunately, God is all-powerful and all-knowing and can easily overcome our failings and accomplish his plans and purposes, even while using us to accomplish it. And 2 Peter 1, verses 20 to 21, provides a good example of how this kind of works out of how God gets his word through people. It says, Above all, you know this. No prophecy of Scripture comes from the prophet's own interpretation, because no prophecy ever came by the will of man. Instead, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So by the power and influence of the Holy Spirit, the prophet's and the writers of the Bible throughout the ages were able to faithfully record what God wanted them to communicate, both Old Testament and New Testament. And a great way to see the proof of this is just in the consistency within the Bible, written by over 40 different authors over many centuries in many different cultures, and they all line up and tell this one cohesive story of God. So our Bible is not just some collection of fairy tales, made-up stories, and poems. It is inspired by God. It is breathed out by him. He is the source of all scripture. And that immediately it puts immense value in it, which is why Paul goes on to say it is profitable. It is profitable. This is why it can teach, rebuke, correct, and train us, because it is his word. And ultimately, this is why we submit to what the Bible has to say, because it's not man's word, but God's word. And in knowing that it is his word, we should desire to submit to it, because as Paul says, it is profitable for so many things. But this means we have to submit to all of his word, because it's all God-breathed. We don't just agree and submit to it when it lines up with our preferences and kind of just throw out the rest of it. We don't talk about it. There's a reason why Paul says it's profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. It's because God, through his word, needs to correct all of our own sinful, selfish, and skewed ways and beliefs that don't line up with his way and his truth. So to be best equipped and prepared for what's ahead in life, we, along with Timothy, should be submissive to God's word, his profitable and good word. We're not going to find anything else like it in all creation because God guided his people throughout time to faithfully write down his word by the power of his spirit 
and compile it all together so that we have what we call the Bible today. And this desire to submit to God's word, it directly contrasts with the evil people that Paul is talking to Timothy about in chapter 3. These people want nothing to do with God. And because of that, they are becoming worse, deceived and being deceived, as Paul says in verse 13. They lack the word of God. They don't want to submit to the word of God. They love everything but God. So why would they submit to the word of God? So unfortunately for them, they aren't going to profit from the word of God. So they'll just be continually deceived. But for us, for believers in Christ, we should want all that God's word has to say. We don't want to be deceived and deceive others like the evil people are doing, right? We want the truth of what God says, not the lies of what our sinful and selfish desires say. We don't want to live and be like the people Paul's talking about. In the beginning of chapter 3, he describes them as lovers of self, Lovers of money, boastful, proud, demeaning, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to the form of godliness but denying its power. No, we want to love God with all of our being, and so we submit to the truth-filled and life-giving words of God that point us to Christ as the Savior from our sins and give us the hope, wisdom, and joy that is found in our new life of faith in Christ. Now, I'm going to cover Scripture's purpose to teach, rebuke, correct, and train for righteousness in my final point, because it all comes together for Paul's ultimate desire for Timothy, that he may be complete and equipped for every good work. This takes us to our final point. Be ready for everything. Be ready for everything. I'm going to read verse 16 with 17 just to put it together. It says, All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The beginning of our passage had Paul focusing specifically on Timothy when he said, but as for you, talking directly to Timothy, but as Paul declares the value of God's breathed word, he concludes it's profitable for everyone, for the man of God, for the believer. Not only is Timothy supposed to profit from God's word, but all believers are. Which is another example of this continuing theme we see in Paul's letters to the churches. For all believers to, con- to be continually growing in their love and knowledge of God. And all of us are to profit from it so that we may be complete and equipped for every good work. Now, <clears throat> our first idea that comes to mind when we think of, you know, personally profiting from the word of God, probably doesn't involve being rebuked and corrected. Because we want the easy and comfortable way to God and his desires for us. But this isn't what Paul says is profitable. The easy and comfortable way will not make us complete and equipped. Instead, we see that God's word has some work to do within all of us. And it will continue to work on all of us for the rest of our lives. The writer of Hebrews puts it pretty bluntly in chapter 4, verse 12. He says, For the word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God's word is powerful and profitable to teach, rebuke, correct, and train us for righteousness. But once again, the profitable part of this does not end with us. It doesn't end with us getting to enjoy and just personally soak it up for ourselves. The profitable part 
in this is that as God's Spirit and as His Word are convicting us and transforming us more and more into who He desires us to be, we then get to live that out and share that with the world. All the benefits and equipping we receive from Scripture is for us to then minister to others for every good work. And when I say every good work, I mean every good work. Not just when you choose to serve during a special event or Love Does Week or you know, when you go on a mission trip or whenever you volunteer, but all of the time for every good work. Scripture equips us to love others well, even our enemies. It equips us to speak kindly, gently, boldly. It equips us to work hard and not be sluggards. It equips us to use the gifts God gives us for his glory and to help others. It equips us to be good parents, spouses, siblings, children, friends, and co-workers. It equips us to share of the hope and salvation we have in Christ. It equips us to not worry or fear, for God is always with us. And it goes on and on. God's word teaches, rebukes, corrects, and trains us for every good work, for every moment of our life. Just as we read from James last week, we are to be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. The other day I was talking with a guy, and um, he's a young adult, and he's not married, and he just threw out the random question, what's your number one tip or piece of advice for marriage? You know, you've been married for this long, like, what, what would you say? And it's funny because people will give a variety of different answers on that, right, based on what they believe and all those things. Some will say, oh, like, happy wife, happy life. Live by that, you're good. Or, like, you know, chocolate can do amazing things. Like, just ch- bring chocolate and you're good. And I thought about it for a second. And my response was, do you know in Ephesians 5 when Paul writes about marriage and he says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her? I said, if you do that, you're good. If you can live humbly, if you can lay yourself down and love your wife, put her needs before yours, your marriage will be awesome. And I knew there's no better answer because I have been taught, rebuked, corrected, and trained by God's word on marriage. And that one sums it up so well. Scripture speaks to every facet of our lives. And it teaches us how to live for the glory of God so that whatever we do, he gets the glory, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10.31. Scripture rebukes us so when we are not doing a good work, when we are living sinfully, selfishly, and not for the glory of God, it rebukes us. Scripture corrects us so that our hope and faith is in Christ alone and in nothing that we did by good works. And Scripture trains us for righteousness so that in response to God's love and salvation, we can live humbly and well and bring glory to God in our thoughts, words, and actions so that whatever we face, we are complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And this was what Paul wanted Timothy to understand. Scripture was not and still is not lacking. Like I read earlier from Hebrews, it is living and active. This is why we hide God's word in our heart. So that we won't be unequipped, unprepared, lacking, or incomplete. So we, church, must be continual learners, submissive to God's word, and ready for everything that comes our way. And we do this best as we treasure and hide God's word in our heart. Let's stand and pray.
Father, we thank you for your word and how it reveals who you are and the salvation that is found in you alone, God. I pray that your word can be equipping us. I pray that we can be diligent and desiring to hide your word in our heart so that we are prepared for everything that comes in this life. God, I pray that we can be continual learners, that we can desire to be learning from those older in the faith and to be in your word, growing in love and knowledge of you. And I pray that we can be submissive to your word, Lord. There's many places and many ways that it it rubs us the wrong way and it convicts us and challenges us. And I pray that you and your spirit can help us be submissive to that, to grow in that, and to learn how to walk humbly in those things, to be transformed and be more glorifying to you in all that we say and do. And Father, I pray that as, as we spend time in your word and as we continue to grow in love and knowledge of you, that it is equipping us for the things we face day in and day out. The anxieties, the stresses, the hardships, times when we're selfish and angry, times when we're broken down and beat up. God, I pray your spirit and your word can be equipping us for everything that we face. Father, we just love you and we thank you that we have your word, that you've protected it and provided it to us, that we can know you and we can know the salvation that's found in you. Father, we just love you and we praise you. We pray in your name. Amen.